Uh, our next speaker will be John Humphreys. Uh, John Humphreys, is that, is that correct? Uh, is an Australian economist who has worked as a policy analyst for the Australian Treasury, a consultant with the Center for International Economics, a volunteer lecturer at uh, Shaishin, okay. <laughs> University in Cambodia, and as a researcher for a Center for Independent Studies. In 2000, he founded the Australian Libertarian Society, which is a co-sponsor of the uh, Fourth International Conference on Climate Change. He has written and spoken on topics including tax and welfare reform, international trade, labor markets, political philosophy, civil society, and economics of climate change. Busy guy. Uh, his work has been published in a range of Australian journals, magazines, and, and papers. Since 2007, Humphreys has run a small, small non-profit organization in Cambodia, the Human Capital Project, which provides alternative financing for poor students to attend university. Ladies and gentlemen, John Humphreys. Good afternoon and welcome. Corey has explained to us or told us how we escaped the ETS. I'm going to tell you now why it's a good thing that we did so. So probably preaching to the converted still, but uh, the economics of climate policy in Australia has been informed uh, primarily by two major documents released in the last few years. The first one is the Garneau Report, which is Australia's equivalent of the, the Stern Review, written by Professor Ross Garneau, who's a previous advisor to a previous Labor government. Uh, and the second major document was the Treasury Costings of an ETS, the Emissions Trading Scheme, which is what we refer to as the cap and trade, or what we call what you refer to as the cap and trade. Uh, both of these documents said that we're facing a very big problem and we should hurry up and introduce an ETS. But uh, strangely, neither of them actually did a proper benefit cost analysis. So that's what I'm going to look at today. To do a proper BCA, we need to plug in four major variables. The first is what would be the cost of AGW, or anthropogenic global warming. Uh, and for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to take, as most economists have taken when they do this analysis, the IPCC mid-range. Uh, I know many people, especially at this conference, would perhaps disagree with elements of that. Uh, I think the mid-range of the IPCC is possible. Uh, I, I and I don't have a strong opinion, really, either way. I think it's reasonable to use the mid-range of the IPCC, and certainly doing economic analysis, I think uh, that's what we have to do. So uh, the first uh, assumption we have to work out, or the first variable we have to work out, is the cost of AGW. The second variable is the degree to which any climate policy can actually prevent those costs. The third variable is the costs of ETS, and the fourth variable is the discount rate. So when we put these variables together, we can then uh, work out a benefit-cost ratio, the benefits divided by the costs, and if that number is greater than one, then the policy is, is potentially good. If it's below one, then it's certainly a loser. So that's what we'll try and work out now. The, quite surprisingly, given the, the hundreds and thousands of reports that have been written about the, the science elements of AGW, uh, very few reports have actually been written about the consequences of potential warming. In fact, only 14 complete peer-reviewed studies have been done, and only 10 of those with regards to the main IPCC central estimate of about three degrees of warming up into the year 2100. Of those 10 reports, the average cost that they work out is actually 0.9% of GDP by the year 2100, so about 1%. That ranges from about zero up into 2.5, but the midpoint is about 1%. Those are the peer-reviewed studies, but of course there are some non-peer-reviewed studies, the most famous of which perhaps being the Stern Review uh, coming out of the UK. The Stern Review took a more negative approach, took uh, a few uh, more pessimistic assumptions about what the world may be facing and found a cost of 2.9%, or about 3% of GDP by the year 2100. Uh, of course, if you have more warming, you'll have more costs. Uh, Nordhaus had a look at one of the peer-reviewed studies, had a look at what would happen if you doubled the estimate of future warming, and found that the cost may be up to 5% of GDP by the year 2100. So we're starting to talk about uh, some quite high costs, but that's the range we have so far, about 1% to 5%, which makes it a little surprising when you look at the Garneau review, which uh, found a number that was actually three times higher than the Stern review. 
The, the report suggested a GDP cost of about 8%, but more importantly, more accurately, a, a GNP, gross national product cost of about 10% of GDP. And that's the best equivalent for the other, uh, the other percentages we've been using. So that is significantly higher than any other cost being used by either by peer reviewed or by Stern. So it's worth uh, commenting just a little bit about how Garneau got his high number. The first point is that he did not use the IPCC mid-range estimate of three degrees of warming by the end of the century. He instead decided to use 5.1 degrees warming for his own reasons. Uh, he then went on and made uh, what I would consider a, a few strange assumptions in his modelling. Uh, one in particular, he assumed that Australia must continue to produce the same amount of food as we are producing today. Uh, because of the warming, the, one of the impacts of warming that uh, he suggested would happen would be less rain in Australia, making Australian farming less productive. So to keep the same amount of food production, he actually assumed that though farming becomes less productive, we take resources out of the efficient sector of our economy and put them into the inefficient sectors of our economy. A more realistic assumption for the model would be that as a sector becomes less efficient, resources go out of the inefficient sector and into an efficient sector. And if you'd made that assumption, the cost would have been uh, quite a bit lower. That actually contributed 1.5% to the 10% costs he found. The most significant element of costs that he found was through infrastructure. And this does make some sense. If we're going to see warming, uh, one of the most obvious costs of warming is increased depreciation of infrastructure and the need to build alternative infrastructure. Desalination plants is one that he talks about. New and bigger ports is another one he talks about. So the concept of infrastructure costs makes sense. What seems a bit strange is the number he has on it, which is 4% of GDP. So this one element of the costs of global warming was bigger than the entire Stern review. The elements of the infrastructure that he suggests were going to be so costly, uh, as a percentage of our current economy, make up 4.4%. So if you put rail and water and electricity and, and all of these together, make up 4.4% of our current economy. So to get a cost to our economy of 4%, he had to assume effectively that our infrastructure sector's productivity is going to more than halve. I suggest that uh, is overstating the, the, the situation. Uh, another of the costs, 3%, uh, making up 3% of the costs, or 3% of the 10, uh, is changes to our trade. And the irony here is one big element of this is that Garneau warns that if we have uh, global warming, fewer people overseas are going to want to buy our coal. So he suggests this is a reason why we need to shut down our coal industry. <laughs> and the last one is, he says, there are, there are various miscellaneous costs, such as potential increased need for defence spending and fewer tourists. And his analysis for this included saying, you know, I reckon it's about 1.5%. So th <laughs> we, th there may be other costs, but uh, I, I want to just point out these, these numbers aren't necessarily set in, in stone. I would suggest a more realistic reading of, uh, of the costs Garneau outlines might get us a number close to about 5%, not 10%, which would be in line with the Nordhaus estimates and back within the range that we were talking about before. So I would suggest that depending on your assumptions of how much warming you think we're going to have, you might say the, the cost to the economy by the end of this century, 2100, would be between 1% to 5%. Peer-reviewed saying 1%, non-peer-reviewed getting up to 5%. But for now, to be nice, for the analysis we're doing today, let's go with Garneau's number and say it's 10%. So the second variable we need is how much of these AGW costs are we actually going to be able to stop? And there's two elements here. Uh, one is, as much as I would like it to be otherwise, Australia doesn't actually set the world's rules on anything. Uh, we only get to impact on Australia's global emissions, and they are about 1.4% of global emissions. That's been going down steadily, and it will continue to decline. Uh, if we turn off all the lights in Australia tomorrow, it's not really going to make a difference to the world. Uh, Gano admits as much, saying that if we were the only ones acting, the most efficient thing to do is nothing. But then he points out that we do have some influence on the world stage. And, and this is possible. So then we have to decide how much influence we have. I would suggest realistically it would be somewhere between 0 and 1%. But once again, let's be nice and say it's like 10%. It should make Australia as important as perhaps we deserve to be. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, even if we, we do get concerted and, and coordinated effort around the world to address climate change, we're not going to be able to stop all of the potential costs. Uh, we're not going to turn off all the lights tomorrow. It's going to take a while, and so everyone admits that you can't stop it all. So we're, 
I think Pat Michaels uh, made a good point this morning on this issue, saying if the world all signed up to America's version of cap and trade, the benefit would be a reduction in warming by 0 0.2 degrees by the end of this century. So clearly we're not going to be able to stop all of those costs that we we're previously talking about. Uh, Gano on this issue gets a bit more optimistic and he suggests that if we all uh, get together and, and have a good international ETS scheme, we can s uh, prevent 80% of the costs. So once again, let's be nice and, and stick with Gano's number. The third variable is what will be the cost of the ETS. Now, various studies have been done before the government got interested in this issue. Most of them were estimating a cost of about 6% of GDP by 2050. Note the different timeline here. We're now talking 2050, not 2100. Uh, the Gano review came up with a bit of a lower number, about 4.5%, uh, but that was well within the range of the previous studies. And the most authoritative study was being done by the Commonwealth Treasury, and they estimated uh, a, a cost by 2050 of 5.1 to 6.7% of GDP, which again is very well within the range of the previous studies. So we seem to have some agreement for the various studies being done on the potential costs of the ETS. Now there are, uh, are some concerns with the, the nature of the Treasury modelling. They assume no leakage because they assume the entire world signs up as soon as we do. Uh, they assume that we remove various bad policies, that the compensation is non-distortionary, uh, and they didn't properly model the effects of inflation or unemployment. But uh, I actually think it's probably a fairly, a fairly usable, a fairly decent estimate of what the costs we might be facing with an ETS. There is probably a worthwhile sidetrack to take here. This is regarding the sort of assumptions people make when they're looking at AGW and when they're looking at the AGW policy. Uh, when the uh, war ministers talk about the costs of global warming, they tend to be quite pessimistic about technological innovation and quite pessimistic about the uh, ability of markets to adapt. But when they're talking about global warming policy, suddenly they become quite optimistic about technological innovation. The Treasury modelling assumes that there will be a significant take-up of carbon capture and storage by 2020 to 2025, and they also become more optimistic about the market's ability to adapt. I agree with the latter set of assumptions. I, I think it is appropriate to make factor in future technological innovation and the market's adaptive ability, but I think it's important that we uh, have those assumptions on both sides. And it's worth pointing out here as well that I think our side, the, the non-scared side of the debate, also sometimes, I think, gets carried away on this point. Uh, perhaps overstate sometimes what the costs of a potential ETS might be because we uh, forget the amazing ability of the market to get around impediments that are thrown in its way and the natural ability of humans to innovate. So I'm going to, uh, for the sake of this, use the, the lowest number that I mentioned there for the cost of the ETS, the Garneau number, 4.5%. But unlike the other assumptions, I actually mean that one. And the last uh, assumption that we need to plug into the model is the discount rate. Now, that uh, was quite a famous debate when Stern came out. Uh, most benefit cost analysis use 5%. I think 5% is appropriate. Uh, but Gano wants to use either 1.4 or 2.7, so around 2%. So again, for the sake of this analysis, let's use Gano's number. So let's see where that gets us. Now you'll have to excuse me, I, uh, I'm an economist, not a graphic designer, so it's not very pretty. But <laughs> that is the model. Over here we have the inputs, over here the result. If that number there gets above one, we have a potentially good policy. If it's below one, we know it's a failure. So we'll tuck in our estimates here. Economic growth to save the debate, I use Garneau's number. The uh, costs of AGW. Remember, peer-reviewed is about one. I think a reasonable range, one to five. But Garno says 10, so let's use 10. Uh, the d amount of that, the amount of the AGW costs that we would be able to mitigate by a, a binding international agreement, uh, I would suggest 50% would be nice, but will be even nicer and use Garno's number, 80%. Uh, the degree to which Australia is able to convince the world, convince America and China and India to all sign up because we signed up. Uh, well, I, I think it's being quite nice to say 10%. And the discount rate, I'll use their number 2%. So over here you can see 
what, uh, what I consider to be fairly uh, generous assumptions to the War Minister argument, we have a benefit cost ratio of 0 0.08. So that is a, a massive fail. So let's be even nicer and say, I'll tell you what, someone tells us that we're guaranteed that tomorrow India and China and America have all decided to, to sign on. They're guaranteed to sign on, so we'll chuck in 100%. Uh, and still we fail, 0 0.76. We can try and get even nicer, use the smallest discount rate they've got available, and we're still failing. So I will just quickly now put in what I think are the most reasonable assumptions. That is the peer-reviewed uh, number, the average of the peer-reviewed estimates of the economic impacts using the midpoint IPCC estimate. Mitigation cost, I think we'd be lucky to get 50% of that saved. The impact of Australia on the world and the discount rate that I think is appropriate. And you'll see now that uh, rounded to two decimal points, the benefit cost ratio is zero. So even if we are guaranteed a world agreement, benefit cost ratio 0 0.03. So. I would suggest we're in a bit of trouble here if we're trying to get this policy to pass. Now I've got a, a range of options here. You can pick your own one, whether you prefer the Garneau case of 10%, 5%, the Stern or the peer reviewed. You can pick a 5% discount rate or a 2% discount rate and assume a global agreement or assume uh, a possibility of a global agreement. And you'll note you can pick whichever number you like. There is no number there that's above one. So I struggle to see any way that any assumptions can get us over the line for this policy. And I suspect that uh, while no benefit cost analysis was actually uh, prominent in the reports of the government previously, I suspect this was actually known by Garneau. There's a, a comment in, uh, in the Garneau report which uh, seems to indicate that they knew that it didn't pass a benefit cost analysis where they said that if we assumed a bunch more costs of global warming and we pushed it out hundreds of years into the future, eventually their policy might pass, which seems to imply that they realised it didn't yet. So what are the implications of this? The most obvious implication, first implication, is don't introduce the ETS. Uh, and we've succeeded in that one so far, but only so far. The government's pushed it off a few years. They still fully intend to do it. There's still plenty of support for introducing an ETS or a similar scheme uh, throughout Australia and around the world. So that's the, the point I think we can take from this quite strongly is irrespective of the science, irrespective if the IPCC is 100% correct, uh, we really are on very strong grounds for opposing the ETS. Uh, second implication is that most policies, most big policies similar to the ETS will fail a similar benefit cost analysis. And that, therefore, pretty much the only policies that would make sense for us to go forward with are policies that I would say are, are extremely very cheap or are no-regret policies. So uh, I'm not going to go into discussing what potential no-regret policies could be. Some suggested before are reducing government subsidies, uh, maybe a tax swap, uh, targeted tax cuts, our civil society action, or perhaps uh, action through insurance markets. Uh, but wh whatever they are, these big schemes fail. Uh, so speaking of insurance markets, that leads us into the final talk. And that's the end of me. Thank you.